So this is the impeachment panel. Now, we're not going to be impeaching anybody today, at least. Um, although I'm watching Benenson back there for his behavior, so we'll see what happens. Um, so let's talk about what is happening now in, in Washington. Um, the developments are almost hourly. Um, last night going to bed, I had planned to start this panel talking about the House's decision to actually take a vote on a formal impeachment inquiry. And then I woke up this morning and saw that we had a new individual coming forward to testify um, with a very interesting background. Um, Ukrainian emigrant, the son of, of uh, Ukrainian emigres uh, who came to this country, I think the 70s, um, former army officer, uh, decorated in the Iraq war, I think was actually uh, given a Purple Heart for uh, wounds he sustained, Correct. in the NSC and heard the July phone call that the president had with President Zelensky and expressed concerns about it and was also in a meeting uh, where Ambassador Sunland told the Ukrainians that they had to uh, deliver uh, on the Biden investigation to receive the aid. And I guess that was the, um, that was the meeting where, where John Bolton and Fiona Hill um, sort of stopped the meeting short because it was obviously going off the rails. Um, is this, guys, let's just start here. Is this testimony similar to what we heard from uh, William Taylor? Is this more damning because he's in the White House and heard the phone call directly? What is the impact, do we think, of, of this latest testimony, of this individual coming forward, Jonathan? Um, I think it's one, it's one more brick in the, in the wall of evidence against the president. Uh, the president and and particularly his enablers on Capitol Hill, his supporters, keep saying that there's no there there. What's the big deal? And yet time after time after time, we're seeing more people come forward who are within the administration. Uh, first it was the whistleblower. Then it was people who were on the periphery. Now we have someone who was not only on the phone call and heard what happened, but who was also in the room, that meeting you were talking about, where Son Ambassador Sondland started saying what he was saying, right. Bolton stops the meeting, uh, cuts the meeting short. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vin uh, Vinman is his, is his name. He says to Ambassador Sondland, what you're saying is inappropriate. And then Ambassador Hill comes back, comes back into the meeting. She tells Sondland that what he says is inappropriate. And then Lieutenant Colonel Vinman goes and reports it to the NSC, to the, to the attorneys, yeah. to, to the attorneys. Um, this is someone who's in the room on the phone call and it's just closing the circle around the president and that this story that they're trying to build that this is no big deal, that this happens all the time and it's not. And as the Lieutenant Colonel says in his opening statement, he declares forthrightly, look, I'm a patriot and I'm an immigrant and I came to this country, believe in these values and I've served Democrats and Republicans and uh, when I see things that are happening that are go, against those, go against those values, I have to stand up for them. Right. And I think the more we see more people like him and like the others who've come forward, the more difficult it's going to be for the White House and for Republicans to say there's no there there. Michael, what's the response gonna be from your party um, from the Republicans on, on, on Capitol Hill when they see somebody with this resume coming forward, not anonymously, but coming forward, um, you know, a, right. a former colonel in the Army, uh, in the, the, the daylight, named person. Is, is it going to be deep state? Is it going to be, or what's the, what's the response? I, I think it's um, appropriate to appreciate the tell. Um, the more serious um, the problem has become for Republicans, the more quiet they are. So I suspect as Vindman and others, and there will be others, uh, particularly, I mean, let's keep in mind an important point here, uh, Jonathan, and that is that Nancy Pelosi would not be making the move she's about to make unless she had every duck lined up. And the Republicans who've been sitting on these committee investigative hearings the last few weeks know what those ducks look like. And they know they do not align for the president in a way that they can go out and make the case, which is why the Washington Post leading off this morning in a story by Robert Costa is talking about the sort of the nervous Nellies, the gnashing of the teeth, the whining that's going on inside the caucus. 
because there is no way that they can save face and go out and argue uh, the, the president's case. So I suspect what, what you'll see with Vindman and what you, what you, along with what you've seen with um, Sondland and others, and, and Son, Son, Sondland uh, is an interesting example of someone who was the president's boy. You know, he was the appointee. He was the guy who was writing the checks to the president to become an ambassador. Um, so he's going there with this cocksure political attitude up against these NSA and ambassadorial appointees who, who take their job and their roles very, very seriously. Um, and so you, you, can, you can begin to see, I think, a lot clearer as the, the reporting has been very crisp on this, just how... Trump tried to game the system for, for his political advantage, thinking everyone would play ball the way he'd want them to play ball, including Republican leaders, particularly in the Senate, who now, if you noticed, have become more and more hushed. I mean, I love the scene that was from last week where the cameras are outside the hearing room and the Republicans are going, oh, oh I'm sorry, I, I'm late for my own hearing. Oh, I can't, I'm sorry, my watch stopped working. What, what, to, what time is it, you know? And that tells me that um, to expect more and more silence, and, and that's not good for Trump inside. Hey, Kiki, should Speaker Pelosi have called this vote on beginning the impeachment inquiry last month and forestalled a month's worth of, a month's worth of process criticisms from the Republican Party? I mean, wouldn't that have denied Republicans in Congress like their only talking point for the last month? No. Tell me why. So a couple of ingredients for people to think about and to put against the lens of impeachment. Um, the first is there is this concept that we have representation in Congress because uh, in the 18th century, not all of us farmers and weavers and butchers had the time or the inclination to be expert in the issues and we elected people who had good judgment to go and learn the issues on our behalf, right? So number one, uh, regardless of when the vote was taking place, it doesn't mean the American people are experts in international law, constitutional law, practices, norms, um, why the dangers, right? Perfectly reasonable reaction for a constituent out in the United States to look up and say, what's wrong with that? Like I, I run the florist shop and I tell the dry cleaner down the street who's part of my local chamber, like if you're not gonna buy flowers for me for your giveaways, I'm not going to, right, that feels kind of normal. So the reality is there has to be a period of education to share with the American people why things are not okay. Not that he did it or didn't do it, right? The issue now becomes, and as the speaker has said on the vote today, this will allow more things to be made public, to be done in public, to share. So that's one lens. So remember why we have elected office, but remember that doesn't make all voters an expert on why it's dangerous for a government to do that, right? So that process has to happen. The next thing that I think Michael's referring to, and we don't know how it will come out yet, is there will be a political lens and there will be a personal responsibility lens by elected officials. One is political leaders will look up and say, what is the danger to me process, to your point, Jonathan, when should the vote be? Yeah. Should I vote for it? Should we force them to vote? Should we say we're going to make a commercial on the day you walk up and vote for it, right? And then there's a personal responsibility vote. I am sworn to uphold this Constitution. And has that been breached? Mm -hmm. And do I care more about the Constitution and what I learn in this process than I care about my own political fortunes? I'm not here to tell you today what will be found and not found through the investigation. Haven't seen it all yet. And so at the end of the day, what the speaker has decided to do is I believe that she is making decisions best on the healthiest process for her responsibility to the Constitution and where she can lead in the narrative, people to understand why she's doing that, including her own caucus, she's doing that. John Anzalone, uh, your firm did some of the polling for the DCCC. Yes. Uh, Second best pollster in America. Yes. <laughs> Just New Jersey. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Jeff Guerin is great. You're right. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so tell me what you saw in your data that you think gave some reassurance to 
Speaker Pelosi and the House Democratic leadership that, okay, we can safely call a vote to the floor and have some of our more vulnerable members vote on this? Well, listen, first of all, there is a big difference even with what happened yesterday to how D.C. insiders and the media look mm -hmm. at it versus real voters. And then you go to, like, where electorally matters in the battleground states. The numbers are much different, right? I mean, you know, I mean, without a doubt, and we can, we can kind of we can kind of go through that. To what you're talking about specifically is that there has been a shift, right? I mean, we see from June to now when the Ukraine thing started bubbling up, there has been a shift for a majority of people not even wanting an inquiry or impeachment to now nationally by about nine or ten points, a majority of people are, right. want an uh, inquiry and about plus three want removal. But when you dig deeper into, again, kind of battleground states and or battle, you know, battleground districts, all of a sudden it's just a little different, right? All of a sudden it's kind of plus five for inquiry, but oh. minus 10 for removal. Interesting. So I think that, listen, voters like to have control of the process. Yeah. At the end of the day, they'd really like to vote this guy out probably more than, you know, uh, remove him uh, by impeachment. Yeah. Uh, and it's also about whether they actually have the stomach for this, right? And we can also talk about how this electorally might matter with, you know, people running for Senate or Congress, et cetera, yes. um, because that's a, that's a whole complete dynamic. But I think that we, we do sometimes forget that, like this guy, it was really compelling, his story is compelling. Does that change how people think in these battleground states about removal? Probably not, you know? Does it help build an argument uh, in the caucus for impeachment? Well, yeah, absolutely. Does it change how Republican senators think about this in the Senate? Probably not. Not 90, yet. Well, not yet, but 94% of Republican voters oppose inquiry. That, that's stunning, right? Oppose impeachment in general. And as long as there's Republican primaries, we talked about this yesterday, yeah. mm -hmm. these guys and women are going to hold the line in the so, Senate. So for the last month, the, the line from the Republicans and, and Congress has been to largely argue on process. And if anything, the, they'll say it's important that the facts come out. I want to hear the full airing of the facts, right? Given that, how many House Republicans do we think will vote for the impeachment inquiry? Not for, not for impeachment, the but just to begin the inquiry and begin a public airing of the facts. I think one. one. Who will one. heard? Will heard. That's it. Yeah. That's about it. I mean, there's there's no appetite inside the Republican House caucus to do more than that. Will's on his way out the door, um, and so he's he's going to to your point about that you know personal, per personal versus political personal responsibility. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna err more on the side of that, and probably I think at least as it looks right now, shine more as an example of the failing of the Republican Party and its leadership on this matter. Um, more than anything else, to sort of sort of set that apart, and you know, here's a guy um, who a lot of people felt um, was kind of pushed out um, because of what he was encountering inside the party itself, and decided I'm not doing that fight anymore. Um, and then you have the other long line of folk, folks from Flake and others who've left yes. uh, before him, and so. Um, this is going to be an interesting moment because the House uh, is largely going to act on a on a partisan basis. I mean, partisan meaning even with one Republican, it'll still be considered a partisan uh, basis. Um, but the question, I think, to your point, John, is how does the country look at it as a whole? And where the trend line right now is the country is moving um, largely because of the president's own doing. I mean. Nancy and, and team have largely kind of stayed out of the, the mix, uh, except for Schiff's initial burping on this uh, in the first hearing, mm -hmm. um, have largely handled this in such a professional way that the public feels that they can make, I think, a, a full judgment and assessment. And I think you've can, seen that reflected you, in the I numbers. Can, I, can, I, can we talk about yeah, why I think can. that is? I mean, yeah. listen, you know, there's a lot of reasons that people dislike Trump, right? And one bucket is... You know, he's a, he's a misogynist, right, who has bad behavior with women. There's, there's another bucket about his antics and his behavior in his Twitter, and he's, and he's bullying and he's demeaning. Then there's another one where people just, you know, just hate his policies, and there's, you know, kids in cages at the border, or it's, it's, it's Paris Treaty, et cetera. This is a new level, and that's why I think we've seen the shift from opposing impeachment 
to supporting impeachment because this is abuse of power and this is now people that that universe that moved believe that he is an abuse of power and he's acting as if he's above the law. So it's a, it's a kind of a new kind of angle for, for a certain universe of voter who weren't quite there on Trump to potentially move away from Trump. I'm thinking of this more as electorally, yeah. um, but I think it's important in, in, in how you know, voters are viewing him um, in terms of that shift. I, let me, can I, can I just ask, add one thing, and I don't have the data to back it up, but I think part of the shift, my intuition tells me, part of the shift, or maybe my longevity as a pioneer in the process, tells me that, uh, you know, with your kids, when you said, you leave me no choice but to ground you. <laughs> like, if I hadn't known that you toilet papered the coach's house, <laughs> like if you weren't stupid enough to leave the picture on your nightstand when I went in to get the laundry in your room, now I have to do it. <laughs> like, I don't really want to punish you for this, right? That's, I mean, and I think that's, that's kind so of where folks are because Linda Moore, who is one of my best friends and is the CEO of TechNet and an all eight year veteran of the Clinton administration, all eight years, had the best message to both the American public and to the Republican team and the White House team, which was, Impeachment, been there, done that, have the t-shirt, don't want to do it again. It's brutal. It's a brutal experience on our country. It's a brutal experience on the staff who, as I understand it, in the Trump White House aren't even meeting until 10 o'clock so in the morning, so I guess they're not worried about it that much. But it, it, it is this thing, to your point, Michael, where the president is the one who comes out and makes the statements, yeah. and you're like, really? Did you have to do it? Because people are trying to earn a living and get their kids to school on time and make sure their church is doing what it needs to do, and, and they don't want to go through this. But he's slowly making it impossible, to John's point, for them not to say, you're right, we have to do it. John, why do you think there is this gap between supporting the inquiry and supporting impeachment and removal? Is it just because the, the latter sounds so punitive, so harsh, so final? Is that what it is? Or is it the fact, the fact that the evidence just isn't, isn't there yet? No, I think it's, it's the former. Yeah. I think that um, people, to, to Kiki's point, it's so, it's so brutal. Um, and final and disruptive, but also the fact that we're coming up on an election also, I think, pl plays into this. To, to John's point, the American people want to have control over the process, and so if they're going to the polls in a year and a month, well, why don't we do it then? But I think the rub, though, comes in to the fact that, as Kiki was saying before, we we send people to Congress to be the experts and to do the things that, you know, that we, so we don't have to worry about running the country. We elect them to run the country. Part of running the country is upholding the Constitution of the yes. United States. And in the face of a president who, like, everything that we know right now, we know that the guy sh should be impeached and should be removed. Also because he's gone out on the South Lawn a couple of times and basically said, yeah, I did it, and so what? Do you, what? what do you, no, it's, what are you going to do about it? Right. That's the threat. Right. That he right. And so if, you, if you're a citizen, to your point, Kiki, you're like, oh, well, you know, what's the big deal? But if you are a constitutional officer and the rules say X, Y, Z, and you do not, in the face of such overwhelming evidence, you don't do anything to uphold the letter of the law and the Constitution, then what does the Constitution mean? I think that, that point is very important to appreciate in the context of the Republican Senate. One of the, one of the interesting tells from uh, two weeks ago was when uh, McConnell was asked about receiving um, the impeachment from the House, and his response was, uh, that we would take it up in the Senate. Now, those of you who know Washington and are of Washington know what that phrase means. It doesn't mean we're going to have an, a trial. It doesn't mean that we're going to take this matter seriously. We will, we will take a look at it, and we will assess it. And that gets back to your point, Kiki, from the political stand. We're going to assess the political damage of this when it comes from the House. Notice he put the political, from my perspective, as, as a lifelong Republican, it was a glaring, jarring moment um, that he couldn't, he couldn't link it to his constitutional responsibility. And it was almost as if we were in, in, in Merritt Garland territory again, where it was this fuzzy, well, the Constitution isn't very clear about whether or not we actually have to, you know, 
take the president's nominee for the Supreme Court and push them through and give them a hearing and do, and do all of that. Um, and I think you're going to see the same kind of mechanical play here, at least potentially initially from the Senate, um, depending on just how strong that comes out of the House. And that relates to how well the Democrats present this case to the American people. At, at the end of the day, don't we think that Mitch McConnell um, is only interested, I mean, he's not interested in what national opinion is. He's not interested in, you know, battleground states. He's not interested in uh, swing voters, independents. He's interested in Republican primary voters, That's right? right. Uh, he, at the end of the day, is head of the Republican Senatorial Campaign Committee, right? right? And, and has know, his own race, and and he's and he's gonna like. He, I think he's gonna bury this like he's he's the graveyard guy, right? I mean, he's the grim reaper, and he's gonna kind of treat it like the, whatever the twenty two hundred and eighty bills that Nancy Pelosi sends over, because ninety five percent of self ID Republicans oppose impeachment. Whereas, by the way, what this is really interesting, seventy five percent of self ID Democrats support it. So that's a twenty point difference in like there's there's actually. Uh, conservative and moderate Democrats, who in a way, I believe, take this, again, it's because they take it seriously, and this is such a big, you know, trauma yeah. to the American government, but there's a 20-point difference in how they view it, and who, who breaks off. Five five percentage points from Republicans, 25% from, yeah. from Democrats. So the Democrats actually take a, take a look at it, a lo I think, a little bit more responsibly. Mm -hmm. Michael, you get, to your point about Mitch McConnell, because you made that point on in the interview that we did, and then a couple of days later there was a story in the paper about the fact that uh, Majority Leader McConnell did a PowerPoint presentation for his caucus, basically laying out, right. like, here's how this could go down. And so do you think, given that story, that he's still just going to take the articles of impeachment and have a sort of a pro forma session and call it a day? Or do you think he, by doing that presentation, he's acknowledging the fact that he is going to have to actually do a trial in a, in a real way? I, I think that, when it comes to that. I, yeah, I think that's a good question, it's, and it's reflective of the reality that we started the conversation. Uh, talking about, and that is um, them and then others. You've got these voices now who are individuals, a character that, that the Republican hacks can't tear apart. You, you, can't, you can't do to them what you tried to do to Mueller, what you did to Comey, what you've done to other politi political or non-political actors um, in prior settings. So I think there is an acknowledgement that You've got these, these men and women who have served across administrations who are coming forward having sat on a phone call and listened to the conversation between the president and the president Zelensky of Ukraine, who then afterward, real time, either copiously noted what occurred or went to a superior officer and relayed their concern. You cannot dismiss that if you're Mitch McConnell at the end of the day, and they know it. So what you're seeing is this preparation of, okay, if what comes from the House is real, this is what you need to know, and this is how we're going to probably have to deal with it, meaning, yeah, we're going to have to have a trial. At that point, I think it opens it up. I mean, there is truth um, to uh, the, the, the narratives and the storylines that have been reported about where Republicans really stand on this in the Senate. There is, yes, about 8 to 10 that will probably officially go on the record and raise their hand up, but behind them there's another 10, possibly 20, who could be moved into that position, and a lot of that's going to be based on evidence. You know, there, there are three other things I'll add for people to think about in this. If I'm not mistaken in modern times, um, Clinton's impeachment comes at the end of his two terms. He's not going to run again, right? Definitely issues for Gingrich and the rest of the gang, but there's not another presidential campaign looming. Al Gore has some thoughts on that, but we don't need to get into that. I don't need to share those today. The, um, <laughs> at Nixon, right, who's on his way to impeachment when he finally gives up, pleads internally and says, okay, I'll get out of town, also doesn't have a reelect to get into. It's the reelect that got him into trouble. So, so think about the difference when people compare those dynamics. The other dynamic, frankly, is for Bill Clinton's impeachment, for the American people to understand what it is to have an inappropriate relationship and then lie about it, super easy. Everybody's an expert on that in America, right? 
this one to go through a trial, a much more complicated structure. And then the third thing I'll leave you with is that the Clinton administration did something super smart, and I think um, this will be something that Speaker Pelosi thinks of because she's not in the White House, but she does have a Congress to run, and that is uh, the impeachment function was completely walled off, right? We had a whole different team that took care of it. I can name the staff. They took it. You know, um, my, the White House spokesman went to the podium every day, focused on work, and so the work even in the end, even though Bill Clinton didn't have to come up for re-election, but he had Democrats in Congress who were going to be up for re-election, Al Gore needed it to happen, right? The work continued. And then the last thing, and it's more of a question that I think is the wild card, is at what point does Pence look up and go, hey, tipping point, I'm the solution. Everybody in. Uh, I can answer that. Um, never. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, guys, all of this... Uh, all of this leads me to wonder if we're not getting to a place where the Senate Republicans actually have a pretty easy line. And I think where this is going suggests that the line is going to be something that Jonathan alluded to, which is uh, what he did was wrong. A president should never do that. I don't like it. But guess what? The American people are going to have a chance to decide the presidency in 12 months or 11 months. We can't remove a president in an election year. That, that's just that, that's not right. Let's do a censure vote and move on. I mean, it just seems like that's where this is going, where the facts are going to be so bad that they can't defend the facts, but they're not going to want to remove him from office. So the middle ground is you, you just say that um, let's let the American voters settle it and let's do some kind of a censure. I mean, it just feels like that's where this is going. I, I don't see before primaries any – any appetite among the Republican senators, and Rob could challenge us if he wants to remove Trump from office, outside of maybe Romney and Murkowski, well, perhaps Collins. So, so this is, in a way, a central question, because I don't think there's anyone in the room or watching who actually believes the Senate is going to remove Correct. Trump. So at that point is... Given the is, facts right now. Right, given the facts right now. And, and so if that is the case, right. will this process help Democrats or Republicans electorally, or will it be a you think? Well, I mean, I think that the honest answer is no one really knows. I mean, I think that we really just don't know right now. But I think the analysis is is that don't look at national polls. Um, look at, you know, look at the five, you know, closest battleground states. Yes. What happens there? It's a little more dicey, right? Um, look at the whatever, 57, you know, um, battleground congressional districts. And I think that at the end of the day, we don't know. I do know this, that if I, as a consultant – rather be talking about impeachment or rather be talking about health care. I'd rather be talking about health care. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not afraid about talking about impeachment right. because there's like really bad stuff here and it's right. taken it to a new level. But I'm not sure that anyone wants their races completely defined by it because it takes a little control out of that, that you know, that. Which is why the speaker held, I'm sorry, which is why the speaker held out so long until yeah. there was so much on the front lawn she had to call mm -hmm. it out. Right. Yeah, I, I think... Uh, you raise an interesting scenario, uh, Jonathan, with, uh, with that. And I think there's a lot of truth to it. And I can just tell you straight up, knowing Donald Trump uh, as I've come to know him, that that is his best case scenario. He will ride. Does he see that? He, oh, oh trust, yeah. He, he will does. ride that horse all day long. He'll take a censure. He'll, he'll take, okay. yeah, because what does the public think of a censure? What does the public know about a censure? Uh, that that's what we're talking about. So from his perspective, this becomes the narrative that he can then say, yet again, they came after me, but you stood with me. Yet again, through Mueller, through phony impeachment trials, right. they came after me, and they couldn't pull the you trigger. Know, I, think you call, and, I think you will tweet out that the Republicans are cowards. He's already Rob, done. Rob Collins, what do, McConnell, we're going to censure votes in Florida. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think Donald Trump sees a censure as half as perilling, imperiling as impeachment. Yeah. Impeachment oh, is a, impeachment, censure, censure, you take a censure all day long because the public doesn't know what it means. It has no effect. It has no but impact. But he sits there believing that the, the Senate shouldn't even take it up, that they shouldn't vote, they shouldn't do anything, it should all be gone. Guys! Wait. He's going to lie about it. Yeah, so that's a yeah. Right. yeah. Completely vindicated. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. That's, 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 that's my point. You're right. 
That's my point. That's exactly. That's why I said but he's. Rob, the, would McConnell allow a censure vote to, to come to the floor? You know? Right. Whatever will help. That's a very McConnell well, that's answer. That's his job. <laughs> that's such a McConnell answer right there. It's, it's right. No, he's got, you're right. He's going to protect his, his members. Uh, and, and to the extent that Trump, I mean, Trump is not going to throw Republicans under the bus in that regard. If, if to, to Rob's point, they're seen as protecting both themselves and the president. I mean, there's no, yeah. there's no upside for that. My broader point is that anything short of a full blown impeachment trial, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Trump's going to walk away from this, and he's going to turn that knob, and he's going to refocus the camera, and it's going to be the close-up shot on him, and he's going to look into it and say, they blinked. And he's going to move into the campaign. So and does, the, does that re- argue for delaying and making it last longer, not getting it over earlier so which, they can recover I, from which it? Is all, he would, would love that. He would, he would love to have he would, that. He would he love can, it to have, go early and be done. And no, he'd, he'd like, like, he, he'd he'd like it longer because that's what he can, that becomes a new whipping boy in the, in the campaign. He can just he talk about impeachment at every rally. But guys, I, I think part of the challenge for the Republicans in Congress right now is that they would love, at least some of them, not the, the hardcore folks, but a lot of them would love to be able to pivot to a really easy message, which is part of what I just articulated earlier, which is, the president should not have done this. The president should never conduct foreign policy that way. It was a mistake. But, you know, he's a different kind of president. Uh, I don't agree with it, but let's move on. The problem is that they can't pivot to that argument because Trump wants what Joe said, which is only, no, it's all phony. It's a witch hunt. That's right. Complete and total. total right. he, he won't plead. In other words, Jay Mart, he won't plead. Right. Yeah, right. He's he's the his own allies right. Right. take what is the easiest pivot in the world. That's, which why, is, that's why I don't think he, he would see censure as a victory. He would he would call them all cowards. I really believe that. Yeah. You know, his people might tell him, "Hey, be be happy with the win and let's move right. on." But yeah. I don't well, think his people tell him a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, I don't think George, I don't think George Conway believes that he you know he would take that as a win. And you know, he so lives, if you're he but, lives in an alternate oh, reality. It doesn't matter what the Senate does. He's going to say right. what the Senate did. And the 30% of the people who drink his bathwater every morning on Fox News mm, are going to believe it. <laughs> it's really easy. I mean, you're right, Jay Mark. Yeah. Whatever the Senate does, doesn't matter. He's going to be completely vindicated. Well, um, and again, that's why the full blown uh, you know, impeachment process has to be done in a politically neutral way. Um, where, well, in other words, I, I look at it, it can I, be. I look, well, yeah, I look at it. Process. I look at it at this. It is a politi- <laughs> it's, it is an inherent political process. It is not necessarily a partisan process. So, and so that's what you need to be careful. Let's move on to 2020 implications. The president, as of right now, is likely to be impeached and um, probably not removed, but definitely impeached. Um, by the time of the New Hampshire primary, which is February, I want to say, the 11th of next year. What does that mean in a primary? Does that mean that... In a Democratic uh, primary or a Republican primary? No, in a Republican primary. primary. Uh, Does that mean that, you know, Mark Sanford um, or Bill Weld is going to have an ability to get 30% in New Hampshire or less or more? Can I I just be, can I just be Rob's spokesperson in this moment? (laughs) (laughs) No, no. But but I'm, I'm... All right, but I'm in your seat, and you and I tend to agree on a lot of things. (laughs) And as a former leader of a committee, no. Yeah. No. No. Nothing. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt at all. I mean, look look at that right now. We're in three statewide races, and the the Republican nominee in Louisiana, uh, Eddie Rispone, all he's running right now is Trump ads. Like, literally Trump speaking about you know, beating up the, the incumbent governor. It's happened right. in Kentucky. It's happening. They're all Trump. Right. This has not changed their narrative, right, for their base. Or if you go into Republican primaries, it's not going to change their narratives. You know, there's, you know, uh, 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 in Alabama, uh, uh, I am proudly represented by Martha Roby, who's an NYU graduate, a very proud graduate. She's awesome. But she's retiring. And that Republican primary right now, they're running TV ads, and you, it's who can be the biggest Trump yeah. guy. And, the, you know, the fact is, is that none of this matters. Do any well, facts Trump, change well, But that? remember, but no. Trump is not running. Trump's not going to run an expansion strategy. He's going to run a base strategy. Yeah. Like, he's not struggling with what we do on the Democratic side. Should we run 
a base campaign or should we right. build a he's coalition? All he's all he's base, not yeah. building a coalition. So, he's running a hardcore base strategy. So if you are an uh, independent voter in New Hampshire, do you play in the Republican primary to send a message to Trump that you don't like his behavior? Or do you play in the Democratic primary because that's where the action is? Because that's where, it's not the action. It's not because of the it's action. The answer it's because Trump. what is at stake. Okay. That independent voter believes that there's a lot at stake. Yes. And so they're, I think, going to go in there and vote in the Democratic for primary <laughs> for, for the person they believe can beat Trump. That will be their why they get into that primary. Bernie Sanders. Joseph Robinette Biden. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., he said. Go ahead. No, I, no, I didn't have anything okay. to add. <laughs> that's honorable. Right. That's honorable. But can, can I also say one thing that's really interesting? Is there's, a, there's a universe. There's a universe of voter who um, supports inquiry. Yes. But doesn't support removal. It's like seven percentage points. The demographics on those are pretty interesting. Yes. Fifty percent of them are independent shooters. It's younger, that. low information. A third of them are eighteen to thirty-four year olds. Yeah. And again, if 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 you know, uh, part of that is because they haven't been paying attention as you would expect, and they're low. Information. They're called low information voters. Eh? Yeah, I'm being yeah. delicate here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they are they are folks who are watching the live stream here. Um, to put it mildly, um, <laughs> no. Um, so how's the, their subscription rate? Uh, not strong. <laughs> okay, just check. on the Democratic side, um, does an impeachment and a failure to remove change the, the, the Democratic primary for president at all? Does that help anybody? No. But the Kamala Harris folks are convinced that this could actually be her last best shot to make a move. That the impeachment trial will be her opportunity to stand. But it out. won't be about impeachment. It will be about her, her performance. I, I, and let me tell you, yeah. say something about her in terms of her carriage and her self-presentation. Kamala Harris, to me, is one of the most presidential of the candidates I've ever seen. And I don't mean, and I mean that, uh, that yeah. she is authentically that, that she, um, when she presents, when she speaks, when she commands a moment, and I've believed that since the very beginning of her campaign, which is why there's a lot of frustration, whether you wanted to support her or not, about the gap between that and where her message structure is, right? Um, and she does have the ability for people to see her leadership skill in a different light because those moments, I think Lily is smart enough <laughs> to, to not do this with her, but uh, those moments will be about her leadership skill and not her campaign message. Mm -hmm. And that, that could be a moment, but it won't be about the outcome of impeachment. Right. Does that and, make sense? And, and, and to add on to what you're saying, Kiki, the reason why Kamala Harris, every time she gets a bump, leave aside the first debate, but when the fascination with her increases, it's always after a hearing. Yeah. Always after you know, questioning Jeff Sessions, questioning someone at a hearing where she's just, she's very clear, she's focused, she's direct, she's not, there, there's no I am Spartacus. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no gilding the lily. She's just, as she keeps saying on the campaign trail, I will prosecute the case against the president. And you see in those hearings, her prosecuting whatever case is in front of her. And so if impeachment rolls in, if there is a trial, that will be the moment when she will shine, not because she's running for president, but because that is her wheelhouse. I, 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 I get all that. Um, <laughs> Does that mean you don't agree with that? Here comes the cold water. Yeah, I, I get all that. I, Here comes I, the shade. I do. No, no, no shade. I mean, I, I just think for both a Cory Booker and a, a Kamala Harris, um, those types of exposures are, are detrimental, could be potentially uh, deadly. Why? Because primary voters uh, are not... They're different consumers of information. They're different consumers of the visual. Um, and their assessments are not the same as others who are just kind of casually engaging. Oh, wow, that's really cool. That's really neat. She did a great job. I think you're right. You're both right in terms of how she can come off and do the performance. But there's also how, I don't know if we're very clear how voters are actually going to read that. I don't think we really primary, know. Primary, primary voters. Primary voters, right. What, how, how else do you think they'd read it? Why do well, you, I think, I just, I I'm think, not arguing. No, no, no. I think, I think they can walk away from it and go, I really don't want a prosecutor. 
I don't. I don't want but someone. She, I don't want that, someone. I, but I, I think that's what, what she doesn't come across as. In no, this actually, she does, and 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 she does a lot in communities where she shouldn't. <laughs> so you know, you know, you look at you. You talk to folks. I mean, look. What's her number in California right now? Low. All right, so she's not leading in her own state. Hello, can we, can we digest and process that, folks? She's not leading in the state in which they know her. She's fourth in the polling in her own state. So you have to understand the, the critical question for me in po all of politics is the question, is the answer to the question, why? And you have to understand the why. And that translates. People outside of California look at that and go, well, wait a minute. Why isn't she leading in California right. if she's all of that? So I don't think an impeachment trial in the Senate is something that's necessarily going to translate into like that moment where you get that bump and everybody's like, oh, I'm down with Kamala. Oh, and no, I, no, no, no. Don't, the, don't, we should, don't, don't misread that. Remember, the, the question was leading by the prosecutor over in the gingham, right? which, was, which, was her, which, was, which was her team believes this will be her moment. I think everybody's well, in agreement. Well, her team needs to get a well, check. Wait, well, what I, what, we were saying, what I think Jonathan and I were referring to is, you're right, they do, yeah. and there could be a moment for her. It doesn't hand her the nomination. Right. It could give her right. some oxygen back in the game. Right. Fair point. Four, four primary voters who, as John just said, want to defeat the president. Well, the, the, the but that, does, but the, that doesn't necessarily mean that's done by a prosecutor. All right. No. But, but I, can I just say one other thing? No. Just, the interesting thing about Go the hands whole up. impeachment okay. process since the <laughs> Ukraine call is doesn't it feel like it's just frozen the presidential race, right? Because it is the narrative now. And I don't care yes. what presidential does candidate it, it is. It's, it just feels like... You know, it's just a little tougher to break through, whether you're in Iowa, New Hampshire, so wherever do, you're going. Is that what it feel like on the ground in the I, states? I think that, yeah. Does it? I, I don't think know. That, I just think that it, it yeah. feels like everything has been frozen and that the narrative has gone away from the presidential candidates, what differentiates them, versus, like, now it's just it's impeachment at the national yeah, level. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's, can I, real quick on yeah, that, John, sure. I, think that's, I think that's right. And I, and I think the reason for it is because <laughs> folks now are actually – framing and reframing this in the context of the president's own behavior. They're looking at it a little bit more carefully. They're paying a, little, a lot more attention to it. So the politics of running for president are kind of taking a back seat for a lot of voters right now. And so they, you're right, that freeze framing moment, I think, has occurred because of the revelate, the way the revelations of information yeah. has come out. It's, it's garnered people's attention in a way that it probably otherwise wouldn't. Uh, I'm going to do one last, John. I want to do one last uh, question, and then I want to open it up for uh, Q&A here from our uh, very attentive audience. Um, and so yesterday you mentioned something I thought, I thought was fascinating, and that was your concern that an impeachment vote in the Senate could effectively put on the blue jersey, as yeah. I put it. Yeah. Sort of put the blue jersey on these candidates like Mark Kelly in Arizona, Cal Cunningham in North mm -hmm. Carolina. Um, Teresa Greenfield in Iowa and, and others who, uh, Sarah Gideon of Maine, who are challengers, who are not even in the Senate, who won't vote, right. but who are going to be running against um, Senate GOP incumbents next year. Um, is that still the case, do you think, if the vote is in December? Like, you know, is that still going to sort of drive the, the, the election in this next November? I, you know, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. If it's really quick, there, there's no doubt about that. I don't think that, but again, if you're in North Carolina, uh, which is one of these states that, you know, shows a big difference yeah. in terms of support or, or um, opposition, you know, if you're Cal Cunningham, you want to be talking about being an Iraq vet, right. being about a state senator who worked across party lines, who against a guy, Tillis, who, by the way, is running primary ads about Trump, having to defend himself that he truly is a Trump supporter. To win a primary. Yeah. To win a frickin' primary. Um, and, and who, you know, uh, isn't known by 30% of the electorate. And so it just, again, you don't, want an, you don't want that to be the narrative when you have so much work to do, not only on, on the fact that he is a great moderate and has this great record and he's going to talk about health care and education, et cetera. That's what he wants to be talking about. And so he doesn't, again... He's okay with some of that blue jersey, without a, without a doubt. It's like Carolina blue. It's light blue. Um, but, you know, you know what I'm saying? But he doesn't want the narrative to be the entire race about that. Are, 
Are Senate Democratic candidates or House Democratic candidates in October of 2020 going to be able to even be talking about health care and, you know, policy issues? Or are we going to be in such complete disarray at that point as a country in which the only topic is going to be Donald Trump and his, his attempt to hold power, you know? I think this will separate quality candidates from not great quality yeah. candidates. And by that, I don't mean great leaders or they'd be good in office but a campaign that will run with a significant level of discipline. Yeah. Again, a little bit of an apple and an orange, look at what the Clinton team was able to do during his impeachment process and to the point of the discussion. If this goes quickly, very fast yeah. at the front end, right, that's four lifetimes yeah. in a cycle by the time you're a general. They'll all have to figure yes. out the answer, like that's people are having to answer the question on Kavanaugh, right? We saw it in yeah. Kentucky on the Senate race, having to answer how would you have voted, right? Everybody knows those. And if you're a disciplined, quality candidate in campaign, you're going to have your answer. You're going to know what you need to do in terms of your electorate, and you're going to know where you need to, you know, hopefully people at this point have learned not to straddle this crap and just take it and move. But that's going to separate quality campaigns and yeah. candidates from the, running I, I, campaigns I, I, and candidates. I, I, <laughs> you have I, a choice. Yeah, you do. Um, and Donald Trump's going to make it for you. And, and I think Democrats need to be careful and not think 2020 is going to be 2018, where you could, as a candidate running for Congress, talk about health care. Pre-existing conditions. Yeah. And get into that yeah. and just really like, oh, yeah, let me lather myself up with some pre-existing conditions, right? <laughs> That's that just not... That made a little personal. That, just, well, it was. <laughs> I, I had a moment. You're, you're better, I did. I had a moment. Your better <laughs> half is here for crying out loud. Pharmaceutical yeah, there was, there, the there, there was yeah. a moment. I had a flashback. It continues yeah. for 12 hours, contact doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so I really think, I really don't, I really think we need to be careful and not underestimate the power of Trump. Yeah. He is a man who creates TV. Yeah. He and he did. wasn't on the ballot in 2018, right? Directly, he wasn't on the ballot. He inserted himself in individual races, but he wasn't on the ballot. He will be on the ballot in 2020. And to the point that was yeah. made earlier, and I think you made it, it will be only yeah. about him. Yeah, and I, every I candidate, that. Democrat or Republican, will have to account for and answer his ish every day. Well, especially if he's losing in the polls, you know. Every day. By five to seven points or more. The level of sort of scorched earth, and um, it's going to be so intense that I'm not sure what kind of message it will. So you're going to you know. need to develop, and I've been saying this for a long no. time now. You have an asymmetrical actor, a prime yeah. actor, prime figure, in a conventional game. Yeah. Everybody still plays a conventional political game against Donald Trump. He knows your move because before you make it because you're a conventional player. Yeah. We know what conventional players do. We know what they look like. We know how they move. I know how to get you pissed off, and I know how to make you happy, and I know how to make you sad, and I'll push those buttons all day long. I can create a distraction if I want to, or I can undistract with a new distraction. Right. <laughs> so that reality, I think, is something you've got to take into account whether you're running for Congress, the Senate, governor. Because if you're on the ballot in 2020, there will come a point where a local reporter, not a national one, is going to ask you, Donald Trump said today, and what is your response? Right. I think what's going to be fascinating in 2020 is whether it gets to a point is, um, you know, it's easy for Trump to go into Lake Charles, Louisiana, for Eddie Rasponi in a plus 20. Uh, state, yeah. Right. I mean, and, and you know, and beat it, beat, beat sure. John Bell Edwards up every day on Twitter. But is McSally going to want him to come in? Yeah. Is yeah. Tillis going to want him to come in? Right. I mean, are, is yeah. Gardner going to want him to come in? That what I think will be that's fascinating that's because you point. know you could you know it's like he's yeah. great at bringing out new people and great great bringing out his base. Right. Uh, and you know what I think he's the best at? He's the, actually the best at defining the Senate or Governor candidates opponents. Yeah. He does, he does a job for them. Yeah. Yeah, but totally it'll be really that. interesting whether he's going to be welcomed into those places. All right, let's, do, let's turn to some audience uh, Q&A here. Who has a question? Who's got the yeah. mic? Got the microphone. Pass the mic. Puff, puff, pass. Martha's got Since I think Spence wants to be president, what do you think you'll do? Maybe he could go and help with the impeachment. <laughs> 
Well, I laid that out and J-Mart shot me down, so I'll let J-Mart handle that. <laughs> go ahead, J-Mart. Pence is going to go good. down with that ship, man. I, I think he, he's going to be the last. Oh, he's going to be. Like <laughs> huh. I'm worried if he does. I just, and, uh, you know, please, Rob, can challenge this if you want. I, Rob, know, from knowing Pence like I do. I Elise just think, can challenge it. Uh, well, he doesn't kiss Trump's ass, right, like Trump said. Who, Pence? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think he's going to want to challenge uh, the president, uh, even when all the chips are down, because he's going to want to sort of preserve his future with the Trump voters. And the Trump voters, um, it may be a, redu a reduced or even spent force, but it's still going to be a decent share of the electorate, especially in a Republican primary. Look, I mean, my sense is that 2024, if if Trump is defeated, you will have three segments of the Republican <clears throat> primary. Uh, you will have the hardcore Trumpers, the dead-enders. You will have a kind of uh, the half-pregnant Trumpers who will try to kind of balance between, look, I think um, he got a raw deal from Democrats and the media, but obviously it was kind of an experiment. He was a little bit rough, rough around the edges. And then I think you'll have the never-Trumpers who are, we, we told you so, right? And so I think you have those three groups, and Pence clearly is going to want to have the support of uh, the dead enders. So I, I just, I'm skeptical that Pence is going to ever bail on Trump. I mean, unless Trump actually does, in fact, shoot something after the avenue that'll be, 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 be he'll, he'll become the next Dan Quayle. There you go, the next Dan Quayle, says John Anzalone. I mean, Rob, do you have a question? You were shaking your head there earlier. I was agreeing with you. No, uh, your, your point that, yeah, it's just going to be scorched earth at that point. I mean, yeah. I, that's why, it's like, I'm trying really to imagine, I, I'm trying to imagine. It's rough now. It's, it's just ramping it's up. It's just ramping up. I'm trying to imagine, like, Democrats talking about a prescription drug bill on October 15th next year. <laughs> when, like, Trump is saying, take me out of the fucking White House. I dare you to. I will not leave this place without the 101st, you know, airborne. Yeah, I mean, right. like, yes, but... If you look at our drug bill, it says very clearly that if you have a voucher for fifty dollars or less for your your, I mean, come on. And Trump's gonna be like, "Take you. me out of here, bitch!" You're, yeah. you're not having that. You're just not having that discussion. And I think you just need to right. get an asymmetrical game plan yes, yes. and Give, begin to put it in play. Given that the moderator has oh, now oh, used oh, power, oh, wait, Thornell wait, wait, has, the Doug, Doug 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 has the mic. Doug has the mic. Doug has. Oh, Sorry, Doug. The only. Uh, this will be super quick. Democrats are still abiding by the Geneva Convention. Thank yeah. you. And they got to they got to start tearing it up and blowing it up. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. That's uh, Elise gets it. So <laughs> Opa. Oh, it's a great Opa. party now. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. <laughs> Back to Thornell. Back to Thornell. Uh, so in the house, I I uh, I think there are I think there are so there are 19 Greg Walden retired today, so there's now 19 yeah. House yep. Republicans who have retired. I think those are people that, yeah, yeah. So night, so there are now 19 House Republicans who have announced a retirement. Those are actually people that I think you should watch for this uh, in a vote on impeachment. I'm not suggesting that all of them are going to support it, but you might get a couple. Um, and I think I'll, I think also the Democrats are likely to have multiple articles of impeachment, yeah. which potentially gives Republicans who are, I'm not talking about a lot here, we're talking about a small number, but a, an ability to vote against a couple of them, but then vote for one, not in the Senate, but in the yes. House, uh, and um, be able to, you know, be, be able to have, like, be both, to be multiple things to both people. So particularly for the folks in, who are retiring, that is something to take a look at. And then also to Anzo's point about um, the polling, I think there is actually more room for Democrats to boost these numbers. There are, you know, there right now, I think like 51, 52% support inquiry, but about 83% nationally, um, Democrats right now support the inquiry. So if they get up to the numbers where Republicans are, which is 90% opposed, and then independents are right around 48, 49. So there is some room there, I think, for these numbers to improve um, even more. And, uh, you know, obviously before they got into this, one of the reasons why, I mean, Pelosi was looking at this both from a public opinion standpoint, but it was also her caucus. Yeah. If she had went, for, went forward with impeachment on the Mueller report, 
there, it just would have been total chaos within yeah. the Democratic caucus. There wouldn't have been a unified message. Correct. And to Michael's point, I actually think Pelosi is fighting pretty effectively back against Trump. She's the only, I think she's one of the few people has figured out how to do yep. this. And because she took time uh, and didn't rush into impeachment, yeah. I think it makes this process seem a little more credible. You know, and her favorables I, have I say, moved up. Yeah, right, can and her favorables actually to, have to moved Doug, up now. To Doug's point, you know, everybody walks around talking about Trump being at 93, 94 inside the mm -hmm. Republican Party. Nan the, the path that Nancy Pelosi has gone down this year from the election and who was in her caucus and what that caucus, like, go back and read the coverage about her caucus in December and January and February versus, I suspect if, if, if the second best pollster from New Jersey ran a focus group, I mean, the, or ran a poll inside the caucus, her numbers are as strong inside yeah. that caucus as his are inside the party. And right now, they are all with her. Yeah, I mean. That, the hashtag with her has now shifted from Hillary to, to I mean, Nancy. Well, right? I, I, I'm the guy who said oh, trust, trust Nancy. Nancy. So I just I, I've I've known what her capacity and capabilities have been for a long time, um, and have at, at times That's been Baltimore respect, right? It's total Baltimore respect, right. and and um, it's it's a mat, it's been surprising to me um, to see the Democrats. Um, have this internal struggle and not appreciate what that leadership is trying to do and, and seeing the bigger now. picture. Now they do. Mm -hmm. Similarly, again, you know, that moment on the stage when they go after the guy with the 97% approval, not just in the Democratic Party, but across the country as a former president, um, it tells me that the Dems still have a lot of, you know, things that they still got to work out internally to get on that page where they can effectively go up against Trump next year. I think they're moving in that space. I think Nancy's helping them with this impeachment process unfolding the way it has, the methodical way in which she's allowed the chairman of the respective committees to do the due diligence and to bring before the country um, in, in, a, in a, I'd say, traditional investigative way, and then follow that up with public hearings. Um, I think that's going to be the, the nail. Um, so. There's a lot uh, of that I think Republicans should respectfully look at, look at and appreciate about what she's doing that could trip them up later on. Uh, I know <laughs> I am, and if y'all want any information, call me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I just think, I think, you know, there's a smartness that she's bringing to this process that I don't think... Uh, Republicans fully appreciate, and I think Democrats are now just beginning to say, oh, now, okay, we get it. Well, the Republicans have kind of moved on from Pelosi and, and found found better boogeyman. I mean, what, what's so striking to me is how she's become, uh, sort of Nancy Pelosi has gone from being the San Francisco liberal to the face of the establishment, who, um, and the Republicans have kind of dropped her entirely from their attack ads because she doesn't have the same potency in the era of AOC and the squad. I mean, there's a, a new ad coming yeah. out in, in Kentucky um, and the governor's race that has three Democrats uh, that are the scary national boogeyman, and not one of them is Nancy Pelosi. That, right. That's hard right. to imagine right. a year ago. Same, years same ago. in the new ad of the woman who just ran, uh, is running for uh, Martha oh, Roby's seat. The, her whole announcement ad was about the squad. Yeah. We need a conservative squad. Right, yeah. yeah. It's fascinating, and it sort of speaks to the racial dynamic that is now at work in the country, which is a whole, whole, different, right. a whole different panel. Joel. Yeah, and this is maybe more for Anzo and, and Kiki. Um, I think the American public largely doesn't understand what impeachment is, when it's supposed to occur. Yeah. Uh, you know, with Bill Clinton, by the way, he was impeached in December after the midterms, and it was about lying, perjury, and obstruction of justice to a grand jury. People understood that as criminal. The true roots of impeachment are not criminal. So. If you're it's a looking at this, it's a civil proceeding. Well, right. it's not it only is. a civil proceeding, but it is abuse of power, right. betraying the trust of your office in terms of what the founders thought. So if you're Democrats and you've got to deal with that complexity now in an election year, how would you coach Democrats to talk about this in a way that makes it easy for the public to understand why this proceeding is taking place instead of just waiting yeah. for the election. Well, I, you said some of the key words. I mean, I think that, again, in, in, you know, abuse of power and above the law. I mean, we've, you know, he has taken his antics to a new level um, that bother people, right? I mean, they, they had to put up with all this other stuff 
Um, and I think that that's, I, that's how you frame this. But I, I do, the, so here's really drugs. maybe what I mean by the question, right? Like, and you and I know and we agree yeah. that when you're explaining you're losing. Yeah. Do you have to spend some time educating the public yes. about what impeachment yeah. is here? So, well, so here's the deal. So yeah. I would way pick taking Lin-Manuel Miranda on a press tour over a constitutional law scholar, right? Like say, let me just tell you what Alexander Hamilton was doing the whole thing, right? And it, right, so, but it's, it's not the process. And I'm gonna go where Anza's going. So if, if I were up in Madam Speaker's office right now as Ashley Etienne, who I'd like to say started her career working with me and I'm so proud of that woman, she's amazing, who's running her comms operation. Um, I would make sure that we were in a very tightly controlled space with mm, a half a dozen surrogates out of the House leadership, because the name doesn't matter who they are, with a very specifically defined narrative that puts them all over television, that gives a narrative, not a process. And the narrative is the following. The forefathers put rules in the Constitution to prevent us from ever going back to having kings or dictators. And in that process, they said that if an, a duly elected president, acknowledging that he's elected through the legal process, breaks the rules, they are corrupt, and they hold themselves above the law, it's our job to make sure they don't. And third, give the explanation and the narrative of why it's important in this case. It's not simply in this case, unlike Bill Clinton's case, obstruction of justice, and which for the American public, it was really about an inappropriate relationship, right? In this case, it's not about did you barter uh, that breaks diplomatic and international, whatever the definition may be, but you put our military in harm's way when you allow foreigners to protect. Do you see what I mean? You take the narrative to a third place. So you have to do, one, why it was, why you're a patriot if you believe in it. Number two, what it is they did that makes you a patriot. And number three, what he's doing to hurt patriots. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, that's not tested, but that's something I would go in a room and say, how do we build that narrative off of that? Well, and, yeah. and a limited number of people who deliver and you flood with them. But that also has to be the message frames for the inquiry. Yes. And it can't, yes, see, it's if gotta we get, get into the that's personal right. problems that we have with Trump, then we lose that. That's right. The bottom line is, is that, you know, a candidates who are running for Congress or Senator or Governor you know, they've got to put TV on or mail or digital to actually explain things. And that's not a great use of money. And so it really, I think, is about making sure that during this inquiry, we don't get petty. We don't get to that's the right. other reasons why we hate Donald Trump. We just stick Stay on to this. abuse of power above the law because that's how people are going to learn on this. So when we're sitting there at the news and, you know, Lester Holt comes up, that's the message because that's what people are going to get about this. We don't want our candidates spending money on TV, mail, and digital and radio. That's right. On this. And, and you're right. You're absolutely Joe right. Joe McLean. Both of you are right because that is the original meaning for those of us who are strict constructionists of misdemeanor. Misdemeanor doesn't mean you ran a stop sign. It means you fail to comport yourself with the proper demeanor required by the office. And that includes abuse of power. It includes, you know... It, Failure, failure to live up to the trust. It includes failure to defend, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And I don't think the American people understand what misdemeanor means. Not that we have to educate them about the etymology of the word, but that's where we have to go. And I, the little bit of polling I've seen on this is pretty clear about that. They, they, people get upset about abuse of power. Our spokesman here, um, but she has centralized this. No, she. I mean, she. I uh, think know, she's like, doing great. It is all about the Ukraine. Yeah. yeah. They, she took a. She. Um, she had to go against uh, Jerry Nat, not yeah. Jerry Nadler and Neil and a number of and Maxine Waters and basically put it all in Adam Schiff's corner because that's where the frontliners and the Blue Dogs were most comfortable with, and this argument or this the way in which we suggesting this get prosecuted is exactly how we're Which is great. We're, right I'm not now. complaining. No, I know, no. but I mean, it's actually unfold, which is shocking as a Democrat. Because I think, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
So you're you know, so you're actually having a personal surprise moment. I mean, kind of in some same way that 2018 they were able to just stay on healthcare. You know, this has been actually very but, pleasant. But to but watch. this is where in the in the in the progressive coalition and network, I would say, please keep all your constitutional scholars at home. Please keep all you know, yeah. like that booking operation, the surrogate booking operation needs to be a very different game this mm -hmm. go round. Well, yeah, I mean, I want to see you know Adrian Elrod. Yes. You know, on MSNBC yes. doing this, which she'll do, but we'll also have some Yahoo talking about everyone who, you know, books a Trump hotel. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, that, that's the problem is, is getting surrogates, not necessarily Pelosi, et cetera, but getting surrogates to, to you know, when they're on TV. I because, think the speaker you know, will wheel just, that in. Yeah. Well, she'll reel it in. So you watch AOC's message and you watch her <clears throat> frontliner, they're the exact same thing on this right now, yeah. which is actually pretty impressive. Yeah. The, the Trump impeachment and the Trump conduct more broadly has uh, papered over some of the party's uh, divides that we saw earlier in the year. Um, guys, do we have time for more, or we should we wrap up, or what? Do, what's the clock looking like? What do we think? Time to wrap up, perhaps? Sure. Yeah. We're between one one. We, one, okay. minute, one more. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, so, please go ahead. I'm so sorry. Yeah, there's a <laughs> school of thought in the White House that a government shutdown in a month or two, mm -hmm. either November or December, might delay or slow impeachment. Mm -hmm. So, can you guys just touch oh, on a, a that? How they get through this funding um, uh, cliff that they're facing, and just other issues like the free trade agreement, some things that they could do. Does it, is it impeachment just going to shut all that down? But yeah. primarily on the funding piece, uh, I guess. So, are we going to see any legislation passed? Do you think in the next year? <laughs> Talk about a leading question. Maybe <laughs> the funding maybe more passed out of the House. Yeah. But it'll go to die in the Senate. But the government shutdown yes. question is one that um, I had not, I'd forgotten about. Because yeah. we've been through so many, yeah. you know, shutdowns and aversions that um, the fact that we're coming up on another one, that's the, this is the wild card. What, how will impeachment play a role in that? I'm not, I'm not sure. They've been crazy enough to actually, well, not crazy enough, fiscally responsible enough to actually do things on the budget after the shutdown to ensure that the government stays open. I don't know if they're going to use... What are the rules in the House on essential personnel? Yeah. I don't know. Well, that's a well but this, yeah. is where, this is where McConnell... Well, the Congress will stay working during a shutdown. Well, has said a shutdown not will not affect her. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Folks in the White House think it's either a distraction that would, might be good, or they just don't understand how Congress works, and they think well, they, will shut, they won't be able to do impeachment. Well, yeah, they think, <laughs> they're wrong. They think right now that shutting down the government will stop the impeachment proceedings, and she made clear. Uh -uh. Well, and I listen. McConnell has been really clear on this. Uh, different for, again, he's interested in his Senate reelects. You know, he he's tried to make sure that shutdown and in, in funding is not part of the narrative, and he's kind of been signing off and making sure um, that it won't be there. I, I actually think he'll intervene. He the final bill. No, well, I get that. Yeah. I get that. But he is a, he is a pretty big uh, part of that force on this issue. I, I suspect the parent, the president, will want that win. You know, yeah. he he's happy. That, I mean, the interesting part about this president is he'll take any deal as long as he gets to say it's his deal. He doesn't really care what's in the deal. He's not an ideologue, right? So he'll, if they present a deal to him, he'll do it. Yeah. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. On the lunch.